So that was an incredible experience. Uh, can you maybe speak to what kind of opportunities that opens up that stream of data, that rich stream of data from the brain? First, I, I'm curious, what is your reaction? What, what comes to mind when you put that on your head? What does it mean to you? And what possibilities emerge? And what significance might it have? I mean, I'm curious where your orientation is at. Well, f for me, I'm really excited by the possibility of uh, various information about my body, about my mind being converted into data such that data can be used to create products that make my life better. So that, that to me is really exciting possibility. Even just like a Fitbit that measures, I don't know, some very basic measurements about your body is, is really cool. But it's the, the bandwidth of information, the resolution of that information mm -hmm. is very crude, so it's not very interesting. The possibility of recording, of just building a data set, coming in a clean way, in a high bandwidth way from my brain, mm -hmm. opens up uh, all kinds of, you know, at the very, <laughs> I was kind of joking when we were talking, but it's not really, is like I feel heard in the sense that it feels like the full richness mm -hmm. of the information coming from my mind is actually being recorded by the machine. I mean, there's a, I can't, I can't quite put it into words, but there is a, genuinely for me, this is not some kind of joke about me being a robot. This just genuinely feels like I'm being heard uh, in a way that uh, that's going to improve my life. As long as the thing that's on the other end can do something useful with that data. But even the, the recording itself is like, once you record, it's like taking a picture. Mm -hmm. That moment is forever saved in time. Now, a picture cannot allow you to step back into that world. But perhaps recording your brain is a much higher resolution thing, uh, much more personal recording of that information than a picture that would allow you to step back into that uh, where you were in that particular moment in history and then map out a certain trajectory to tell you certain things about uh, about yourself that could open up all kinds of applications. Of course, there's health that I consider, but I, honestly, to me, the exciting thing is just being heard. My state of mind, the level of focus, all those kinds of things being heard. What I heard you say is you have an entirety of lived experience, some of which you can communicate in words and in body language, some of which you feel internally, which cannot be captured in those communication modalities. And yeah. that this measurement system captures both the things you can try to articulate in words, maybe in a lower dimensional space, using one word, for example, to communicate focus, yeah. when it really may be represented in a 20 dimensional space of this particular kind of focus, yeah. and that this information is being captured. So it's a closer representation to the entirety of your experience captured in a dynamic fashion that is not just a static image of your conscious experience. Yeah. yeah. That that's 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 the promise. That's the hope. That was the feeling, and it felt like the future. So it's it's a pretty cool experience. And from the sort of uh, mechanical perspective, it was cool to have an actual device that feels pretty good. That doesn't uh, doesn't require me to go into the lab. And also the other thing I was I was feeling. There's a guy named Andrew Huberman. He's a friend of mine. Amazing podcast. People should uh, uh, should listen to it. Huberman Lab podcast. We're uh, working on a paper together about eye movement and so on. And we're kind of, he's a neuroscientist and I'm a data person, a machine learning person. And we're, we're both excited by how much the, that, how much the data measurements of the human mind, the brain, and all the different metrics that come from that can be used to understand mm -hmm. human beings and in a rigorous scientific way. So the other thing I was thinking about is how this could be turned into uh, a tool for science. Mm -hmm. Sort of not just personal science, not just like Fitbit style, like uh, how am I doing on my personal metrics of health, but doing larger scale studies of human behavior and so on. So like data, not at the scale of an individual, but data mm -hmm. at the scale of many individuals mm -hmm. or a large number of mm -hmm. individuals. So science, so it's personal being heard was exciting and also just for science is exciting. Yeah. It's very easy. Like, like the, there's a very powerful thing to it being so easy to just put on 
that uh, you can scale much easier. If you think about that second thing you said about the science of the brain, most, we've done a pretty good job, like we, the human race, have done a pretty good job figuring out how to quantify the things around us from distant scar stars to calories and steps and our genome. So we can measure and quantify pretty much everything in the known universe, except for our minds. And we can do these one-offs if we're going to get an fMRI scan or uh, do something with a low res EEG system, but we haven't done this at population scale. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about human thought or human cognition is probably the single law, uh, largest raw input material into society at any given moment. It's our conversations with our with ourselves and with other people. And we have this, this raw input that we can't, haven't been able to measure yet. Yeah. And if you, when I think about it through that frame, it's remarkable. It's almost like we live in this wild, wild west of unquantified communications within ourselves and between each other when everything else has been grounded. I mean, for example, I know if, if I buy an appliance at the, at the store or on, on a website, I don't need to look at the measurements on the appliance to make sure it can fit through my door. That's an engineered system of appliance manufacturing and, and construction. Everyone's agreed upon engineering standards. And we don't have engineering standards around cognition. It's not a for, it has not entered as a formal engineering discipline that enables us to scaffold in society with everything else we're doing, including consuming news, our relationships, politics, economics, education, all the above. And so to me, the, the most significant contribution that kernel technology has to offer would be the formal, uh, the introduction of the formal engineering of cognition as it relates to everything else in society. I love that I, idea that uh, you kind of think that there's just this ocean of data that's coming from people's brains as being in a crude way reduced down to like tweets and texts and so on. So it's a very um, hardcore, many scale compression of mm -hmm. uh, actual the raw data. But maybe you can comment, because you're using the word cognition. I think the first step is to get the brain data. Mm -hmm. But um, is there a leap to be taking to sort of interpreting that data in terms of cognition. Mm -hmm. So is your, is your idea is basically we need to start collecting data at scale from the brain, and then we start to really be able to take little steps along the path to actually mm -hmm. measuring some deep sense of cognition. Because as it's, you know, as I'm sure you know, we don't, we understand a few things, but uh, we don't understand most of what makes up cognition. Mm -hmm. This has been, one of the most significant challenges of building kernel and kernel wouldn't exist if i wasn't able to fund it initially by myself because when i engage in conversations with investors the immediate thought is what is the killer app and of course i understand that heuristic that's what they're looking at is they're looking to de-risk is the product solved is there a customer base are people willing to pay for it how does it compare to competing options and in the case with brain interfaces when i started the company there was no known path to even build a technology that could potentially become mainstream. Yes. And then once we figured out the technology, we could even we could commence having conversations with investors and it became, what is a killer app? And so what has been, so I, I funded the first $53 million of the company and to raise the round of funding, the first one we did, I spoke to 228 investors. One said yes. It was remarkable. And it was mostly around this, concept around what is a killer app. And so internally, the way we think about it is we think of the, the go to market strategy, much more like the Drake equation, where if we can build technology that has the characteristics of it has the data quality is high enough, it meets some certain threshold, cost, accessibility, comfort, it can be worn in contextual environments, if it meets the criteria of being a mass market device then the responsibility that we have is to figure out how to create the algorithm 
that enables hu the human to enable uh, humans to then find value with it. Okay. So it so the analogy is is like brain interfaces are like early '90s of the internet. Is you you want to populate an ecosystem with a certain number of devices. You want a certain number of people who play around with them, who do experiments of certain data collection parameters. You want to encourage certain mistakes from experts and non-experts. These are all critical elements that ignite discovery. And so we believe we've ac accomplished the first objective of building technology that reaches those thresholds. And now it's the Drake equation component of how do we try to generate 20 years of value discovery in a two or three year time period? How do we compress that? So just to clarify, so when you mean the Drake equation, uh, which for people who don't know, I don't know why you, if you listen to this, I bring up aliens every single conversation. So it's, <laughs> I don't know how you would know what the Drake equation is, but you mean like the killer app, it would be one alien civilization in that equation. <laughs> so meaning like, this is in search of an application that's impactful, that's transformative. Right. By the way, it should be, a, we need to come up with a better term than killer app as a-, as a <laughs> it's, it's also violent, right? It, very violent. You can go like viral app, that's horrible too, right? It's, it's some very uh, inspiringly impactful application. How about that? No. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, but let's stick with killer app, that's fine. Nobody's- But I uh, concur with you, I dislike the chosen words in, yeah. in capturing the concept. You know, it's, it's one of those sticky things that uh, is as effective to use in the tech world, but when you now become a, a communicator outside of the tech world, especially when you're talking about software and hardware and artificial intelligence applications, it sounds horrible. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, I actually regret, now having called attention to this, I regret having used that word in this conversation mm -hmm. because it's something I would not normally do. I, I used it in order to create a bridge of shared understanding of how others would, what terminology others would use. Yeah. But yeah, I concur. Let's go with uh, impactful application. Or just value creation. Value creation. <laughs> Something people love using. <laughs> there we go, that's it. <laughs> love app. <laughs> okay, so what, uh, do you have any ideas? So you're basically creating a framework where there's the possibility of a discovery of uh, an application that people love using. Mm -hmm. Is do you have ideas? We've begun to play a fun game internally, where when we have these discussions, and we we begin cir circling around this concept of, does anybody have an idea? Does anyone have intuitions? And if we see the conversation starting to to veer in that direction, we flag it and say, "Human intuition alert! Stop it!" And so yes. we we really want to focus on the algorithm of there's a natural process of human discovery. Mm. That, that when you populate a system with devices and you give people the opportunity to play around with it in expected and unexpected ways, we are thinking that is a much better system of discovery than us exercising intuitions. And it's interesting, we're also seeing a few neuroscientists who have been, uh, have been talking to us, where I was speaking to this one young associate professor, and I approached a conversation and said, hey, we have these five data streams that we're pulling off. When you hear that, what weighted value do you add to each data source? Like, which one do you think is going to be valuable for your objectives and, and which one's not? Yeah. And he said, I don't care. Just give me the data. All I care about is my machine learning model. Yeah. But importantly, he did not have a theory of mind. He did not come to the table and say, I think the brain operates you know, in this way and these reasons or have these, these functions. He didn't care. He just wanted the data. And we're seeing that more and more that certain people are devaluing human intuitions for good reasons, as we've seen in machine learning over, over the past couple of years. And we're doing the same in, in our value creation uh, market strategy. So more collect more data, clean data, make uh, the product such that the collection of data is uh, easy and, mm -hmm. and, and fun, and then the, the rest will just spring to life. That's right. Through yep. humans playing around with it. Our objective is to create the most valuable data collection system of the brain ever. And with that, then applying all the best tools of machine learning and other techniques to extract out, you know, to, to try to find insight. But yes, our, our objective is really to systematize the discovery process because we, we can't put definite timeframes on discovery. 
the brain is complicated and, and science is not a business strategy. And so we really need to figure out how to, this is the difficulty of bring, bringing, bringing you know, technology like this to market. And it's why most of the time it just ling it languishes in academia, academia for quite some time. But we hope that uh, we will over, you know, cross over and, and make this mainstream in the coming years. The thing was cool to wear, but what's, uh, are you chasing a good reason for millions of people to put it, this on their head mm -hmm. and keep on their head regularly? Is there, uh, mm -hmm. like who's going to discover that reason? Is it going to be people mm -hmm. just kind of organically or is there going to be a uh, Angry Birds style application <laughs> that's just uh, too exciting to, to not use? If I think through the things that have changed my life most significantly over the past few years, when I started wearing a wearable on my wrist that would give me data about my heart rate, heart rate variability, respiration rate, uh, metabolic approximations, etc. For the first time in my life, I had access to information, uh, sleep patterns yes. that were highly impactful. They, they told me, for example, if I eat close to bedtime, I'm not going to get deep sleep. And not getting deep sleep means you have all these follow-on consequences in life. And so it opened up this window of understanding of myself that I cannot self-introspect and deduce these things. This is information that was available to be acquired, but it just wasn't. I would have to get an expensive sleep study, then it's an end like one night, and that's not good enough to look at, to run all my trials. And so if you look just at the information that one can acquire on their wrist, and now you're applying it to the entire cortex on the brain, and you say, what kind of information could we acquire? It opens up a whole new universe of possibilities. Uh, for example, we did this internal study at Kernel where I wore a prototype device and we were measuring the cognitive effects of sleep. Mm -hmm. So I had a device measuring my sleep. I performed with 13 of my, of my coworkers. We performed four cognitive tasks over uh, 13 sessions. And we focused on reaction time, impulse control, uh, short-term memory, and then a resting state task. And we, with mine, we found, for example, that my impulse control was independently correlated with my sleep outside of behavioral measures of my ability to play the game. The point of the study was I had, the brain study I did at Kernel confirmed my life experience. Yeah. That if I, my deep sleep determined whether or not I would be able to resist temptation the following day. And my brain data showed that as one example. And so if you start thinking, if you actually have uh, data on yourself, on your on your entire cortex, and you can control the, the settings, I think there's probably an, an, uh, a large number of things that we could discover about ourselves, very, very small and very, very big. Uh, just for example, like when you read news, what's going on? Like when you use social media, when you use news, what, what like uh, all the ways we allocate attention that's right. With the, with the computer. I mean, that seems like a compelling place to where you would want to put on uh, kernel. By the way, what is it called? Kernel flux, kernel, like what? Flow. flow. We have two this, technologies, you yeah. or flow. Flow, okay. So when you when you put on the, the kernel flow, it it is seems like to be um, a, comp a compelling time and place to do it is when you're behind a desk, behind a computer. Because you could probably wear it for prolonged periods of time as you're as you're taking in content and there could a lot of because some of our so much of our lives happens in the digital world now that kind of coupling the information about the human mind with the consumption and the behaviors in the digital world might give us a lot of information about the effects of the way we behave and navigate the digital world to the actual physical meat space uh, effects on our body it's interesting to think so in terms of both like for work, I, I'm a big uh, fan of, uh, so Cal Newport, his ideas of deep work mm -hmm. that uh, I spend uh, with, with few exceptions, I try to spend the first two hours of every day, usually if I'm like at home and have nothing on my schedule is going to be up to eight hours of deep work, of focus, zero distraction. And for me to analyze the, I mean, I'm very aware of the 
uh, the waning of that, the ups and downs of that. And it's almost like you, you're surfing the ups and downs of that as you're doing programming, as you're doing thinking about particular problems, you're trying to visualize things in your mind, you start to trying to stitch them together. You're trying to, uh, when there's a dead end about an idea, you have to kind of calmly like walk back and start mm -hmm. again, all those kinds of processes. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to get data on mm -hmm. what my mind is actually doing. And also recently started doing, um, I just talked to S Sam Harris a few days ago and been uh, building up to that. I started using, started meditating using his app, uh, Waking Up, I very much uh, re recommend it. And be interesting to get data on that because it's, you're very, it's like you're removing all the noise from your head and you very much, it's an active process of active noise removal, active noise canceling. <laughs> like the headphones. And it'd be interesting to see what is going on in the mind uh, before the meditation, during it, and after, mm -hmm. all those yeah. kinds of things. And in, in all of your examples, it's interesting that everyone who's designed an experience for you, so whether it be the meditation app or the deep work or the, all the things you mentioned, they constructed this product with a certain number of knowns. Yeah. Now, what if, we expanded the number of knowns by 10x or 20x or 30x, they would reconstruct their product, co-incorporate those knowns. So it'd be, yeah. and so this is the dimensionality that I think is the promising aspect is that people will be able to uh, use this quantification, use this information to build more effective products. And this is, I'm not talking about better products to advertise to you or manipulate you. I'm talking about uh, our focus is helping people individuals have this contextual awareness and this quantification, and then to engage with others who are seeking to improve people's lives. That the, the objective is, is betterment across ourselves individually and also uh, with each other. Yeah, so it's a nice data stream to have if you're building an app, like if you're building a podcast listening app, it would be nice to know data about the listener so that like if you're bored or you fell asleep, maybe pause the podcast. That's like, yeah, or like, it's like really dumb just very simple applications that could just improve the quality of the experience of the, uh, using the app. I'm imagining if you have, you have your neurom, this is Lex, and you there's a statistical representation of you and you engage with the app and it says, Lex, you're best to engage with this meditation uh, exercise in the following settings. Uh, at this time of day, after eating, this kind of food or not eating, fasting, yeah. Yeah. with this level of blood glucose and, and this uh, kind of night sleep. Yep. But all these data combined to give you this contextually relevant mm -hmm. experience, just like we do with our sleep. We, you've optimized your entire life based upon what information you can acquire and know about yourself. And so the question is, how much do we really know of the yeah. things going on around us? And, and I would venture to guess in my own my life life experience, I capture, my self-awareness captures an extremely small percent of the things that actually influence my conscious and unconscious experience. Well, in some sense, the data would help encourage you to be more self-aware, not just because you trust everything the data is saying, but is it'll give you a prod to start investigating. Like I would love That's to right. get a, like a, a rating, like a, a ranking, of all the things I do, and what are the things, this is probably important to do without the data, but the data will certainly help. It's like, rank all the things you do in life, and which ones make you feel shitty, which ones make you feel good. Like, uh, you're talking about evening, Brian. Like, uh, this it's a good example, somebody like, I do pig out at night as uh, as well. <laughs> and uh, and it never makes like me feel good. Like you're in a safe space. It, it, this is yeah, a safe, safe space. space. It's never, Let's this hear is, it. No, I, I definitely have much less self-control at night, and, and it's interesting. And the same, you know, um, people might criticize this, but it, I, I know my own body. I know when I eat carnivore, just eat meat, I feel much better mm. uh, than uh, if I eat more more carbs. The more carbs I eat, the worse I feel. I don't know why that is. I don't, I, there is science supporting it, but I'm not leaning on science. I'm leaning on personal experience. And that's really important. I don't need to read, I'm not gonna go into a whole rant about nutrition science, but many of those studies are very flawed. 
they're, they're doing their best, but nutrition science is a very difficult uh, field of study because humans are so different and the mind has so much impact on the way your body behaves. And it's so difficult from a scientific perspective to conduct really strong studies mm -hmm. that you have to be almost like a scientist of and of one, you have to do these studies on yourself. That's the best way to understand what works for you and not. And I don't understand why, because it sounds unhealthy, but eating only meat always makes me feel good. Just eat, eat meat, that's it. And uh, I don't have any allergies, any of that kind of stuff. I'm not full like Jordan Peterson, where like, if he like deviates a little bit that he goes off, like deviates a little bit from the carnivore diet, he goes off like the cliff. No, I can I can have like chalk. I can I can go off the diet. I feel fine. It's not. It's a it's a gradual. Uh, uh, it's a gradual worsening of how I feel. But when I eat only meat, I feel great, and it would be nice to be reminded of that. Like it's a very simple fact that I feel good when I eat carnivore, and I think that repeats itself in all kinds of experiences. Like I feel really good. Uh, when I exercise, not, I hate exercise, okay. <laughs> but in the rest of the day, the, the, uh, the impact it has on my mind, on the clarity of mind, on the experiences and the happiness and all those kinds of things, I feel really good. And to be able to concretely express that through data would be, mm -hmm. would be nice. It would be a nice reminder, almost like a statement, like mm -hmm. remember what feels good and whatnot. And there could be things like, mm -hmm. Uh, that I'm not, many things like you're, you're suggesting that I could not be aware of, that might be sitting right in front of me that uh, make me feel really good and make me feel not good. And uh, the data would show that. I agree with you. I've actually employed the same strategy. I, I fired my mind entirely from being responsible for constructing my diet. And so I started doing a program where I now track over 200 biomarkers every 90 days. And it captures, of course, the things you would expect like cholesterol, but also DNA methylation and all kinds of things that, that, about my body, all the processes that make up me. And then I let that data generate the shopping list. Hmm. And so I never actually ask my mind what it wants. It's entirely what my body is reporting that it wants. And so I call this goal alignment within Brian. Mm -hmm. And there's 200 plus actors that I'm currently asking their opinion of. And so I'm asking my liver, how are you doing? and it's expressing via the biomarkers. And so then I construct that diet and I only eat those foods until my next testing round. And that has changed my life more than I think anything else because in the demotion of my conscious mind that I gave primacy to my entire life, it led me astray because like you're saying, the mind then goes out into the world and it navigates the dozens of different dietary regimens people put together in books and it's all has their all has their supporting science in certain contextual settings but it's not n of one and like you're saying this di dietary really is an n of one these what people have published scientifically of course can be used uh for nice groundings but it changes when you get to an n of one level and so that's what gets me excited about brain interfaces is if you if i could do the same thing for my brain where i can stop asking my conscious mind for its advice or for its decision making, which is flawed, and I'd rather just look at this data. That and it, I've I've never had better health markers in my life than when I stopped <laughs> actually asking myself to be in charge of it. And <laughs> the idea of uh, demotion of the conscious mind mm -hmm. is uh, is such a sort of engineering way of phrasing like meditation. With <laughs> <laughs> with the, I mean, that's with, what we're doing, right? Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. That means really beautifully put. I, uh, by the way, testing round. What does that look like? What's that? Well, you mentioned. Uh... Yeah, the the very the test I do. Yes. So it includes uh, a complete blood panel. I do a microbiome test. I do a food inflammation, uh, a diet induced inflammation. So I look for like cytokine expressions. So foods that produce inflammatory reactions. Uh, I look at my neuroendocrine systems. So I look at all my neurotransmitters. Uh, I do. Uh, yeah, there's several uh, micronutrient tests to see how I'm looking at the very various nutrients. What about like self-report of like how you feel? You know, almost like uh, mm -hmm. the <laughs> you can't demote your con. You still exist within your conscious mind, mm -hmm. right? So that that lived experience of uh, 
is of a lot yeah. of value. So do how a, do you measure that? I do a temporal sampling over some duration of time. So I'll think through how I feel over a week, over a month, or over three months. I don't do a temporal sampling of if I'm at the grocery store in front of a cereal box and be like, you know what, Captain Crunch is probably the right thing for me today because I'm feeling like I need a little fun in my life. Yeah. And so it's a temporal sampling. <laughs> if the data set's large enough, then I, I smooth out the function of my natural oscillations of how I feel about life, where some days I may feel upset or depressed or down or whatever. And I don't want those moments to then rule my decision making. That's why the demotion happens. And it says, really, if you're looking at health over a 90 day period of time, all my 200 voices speak up on that interval. And they're all a given voice to say, this is how I'm doing and this is what I want. And so it really is an accounting system for everybody. So that's why I think that if you think about the future of being human, there's two things I think that are really going on. One is the design, manufacturing, and distribution of intelligence is heading towards zero on a cost curve over a, over a certain design, over a certain time frame. But our ability to, you know, evolution produced us an intelligent a form of intelligence. We are now designing our own intelligent systems. And the design, manufacturing, and distribution of that intelligence over a certain uh, time frame is going to go to a cost of zero. Design, manufacture, distribution of intelligence cost is going to zero. For example, Again, just give me a second. Okay. That's brilliant. Okay. And evolution is doing the design, manufacturing, distribution of intelligence. And now we are doing the design, manufacturing, distribution of intelligence. And the cost of that is going to zero. Yes. That's a very uh, nice way of looking at life on earth. <laughs> so if that that's going on, okay. and then now in parallel to that, then you say, okay, what, what then happens if when that cost curve is heading to zero, our existence becomes a goal alignment problem, a goal alignment function. And so the same thing I'm doing where I'm doing goal alignment within myself of these 200 biomarkers where I'm saying when, when Brian exists on a daily basis and this entity is deciding what to eat and what to do and et cetera, it's not just my conscious mind, which is opining, it's 200 biological processes and there's a whole bunch of more voices involved. So in that equation, we're going to increasingly automate the things that we spend high energy on today, because it's easier. And now we're going to then negotiate the terms and conditions of intelligent life. Now we say conscious existence because we're biased because that's what we have but it will be the largest computational exercise in history because you're now doing goal alignment with planet Earth, within yourself, with each other, within all the intelligent agents we're building, bots and other you know, voice assistants. You basically now have a trillions and trillions of agents working on the negotiation of goal alignment. Yeah, this, this is in fact true. Uh, and what was the second thing? That was it. So the, the, the cost the design, manufacturing, distribution of intelligence going to zero, which then means what's really going on? What are we really doing? We're negotiating the terms and conditions of existence.